Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 10th annual Kuntz Calendar Drew Transplant Symposium, sponsored by the Gift of Life Minority Organ Tissue Transplant Education Program and Michigan Medicine of the University of Michigan. Today's event is entitled Empowering the Transplant Community with Resilience and Vision. My name is Kenyatta Stevens. I am the CEO of Black Family Development Incorporated, a behavioral health nonprofit organization in the city of Detroit, Michigan. I also uh, come before you humbly as a planning committee member. Today, it is my pleasure to serve as your coordinator for this morning's session. On behalf of the planning committee, we are so glad that you have chosen to join us today for this event. Those of you who are familiar with our previous symposiums know that we have historically been face to face. We are pleased to announce that the pandemic has not stopped us and that we have a virtual format for you that will still be packed with information and the next two days will be a great experience for each of you. We have an outstanding presenter lineup for you over the next two mornings. So sit back and prepare yourself for a great event. As we begin, I would like to take care of a few housekeeping items. We are grateful to offer special thanks to the entire planning committee under the leadership of Ms. Ramona Chapman and facilitated by Ms. Tanya Smith. We also want to recognize the esteemed presenters that we thank you for your time and we look forward to what you have to share with us. And we wish to express our sincere appreciation to all of the companies whose gracious donations made our event raffle possible. And you'll hear a little bit more about that later on this morning. We also ask that you please reference the event program book. It is an outstanding book that details today and tomorrow's agenda. And there are bios on the speakers and more details about CEUs in the evaluation that we will momentarily uh, touch more uh, briefly upon in a little bit more detail. Today's agenda is visible on this slide and we are blessed to have among our notable speakers, one of the physicians whose passion and expertise has actually brought us here today, Dr. Clive Callender. We do also want to disclose that the symposium has no relevant financial relationship with the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education, but it is through the University of Michigan's affiliation with the AACCME that we are blessed to offer continuing education certifications. Please see the details within our program booklet for the boards and associations who have approved CEUs for this symposium. Lastly, before bringing on our esteemed moderator for this session, we're asking you to turn your attention to page 10 of the program booklet, and you'll see an excerpt from that page on the slide in front of you. That the slide, as well as in the booklet, shows a QR code. And that QR code is one way that you can claim your CEU credits and complete the evaluation. And again, as you reference page 10 on your booklet, you'll have a little bit more detail. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome to the screen Dr. Jason Denny, today's moderator. Dr. Denny has served for 15 years as a senior staff surgeon at the Henry Ford Plans Transplant Institute. He is licensed to practice medicine in three states, those being Ohio, Michigan, and New York. He has received numerous honors and awards throughout his career, and he serves as the chair of the Detroit Minority Organ Tissue Transplant Education Program Foundation. Most importantly, this man of clout, wisdom, and expertise has an infectious personality and sense of humor. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jason Denny. Well, thank you very much, Kenyatta. I want to make sure everybody can hear me clearly. That was a wonderful, wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, I appreciate that. I didn't recognize that person, but I'm very happy uh, for those wonderful uh, accolades that you bestowed upon me. Uh, I am Dr. Denny. I've been a transplant surgeon in Detroit for quite a while now, and uh, I am currently the immediate past chair now of Detroit Multip Foundation, and I'm very proud of the work and the hard workers that we have uh, 
uh, on the foundation supporting um, the efforts of uh, Gift of Life Michigan, uh, Gift of Life Motep. Um, and I want to uh, say a greetings and a thank you to all our board members. Um, I will be moderating uh, today. I really wish I could be in person. We've had a lot of great times over the years. I believe I've moderated 12 years, maybe, maybe 10 years, some large number like that. And it's been my distinct uh, pleasure. Uh, I'd like to inter introduce uh, our uh, personal jewel of uh, Motep, a wonderful woman that everyone uh, knows in Detroit. I cannot go any place with her without people from every walk of life uh, saying uh, hello, because she's touched uh, so uh, many uh, lives uh, over the years. Um, and uh, she really knows how to get uh, people uh, involved. And her name is Ramona Chapman. Ramona Chapman is the director of Gift of Life uh, Motep, um, community outreach manager at Gift of Life Michigan, and has served there for at least 15 years, although she still looks like a young cherub. Uh, she's an advisory board member uh, and a previous uh, past president of the Association for Multicultural Affairs and Transplantation, uh, AMAT. Ramona? Good morning, Dr. Jenny, and thank you so much. I am definitely excited to be here, and I want to welcome each and every one of you to our 10th annual Coombs Calendar Do Transplant Symposium entitled Empowering the Transplant Community with Resilience and Vision. And what a phenomenal title to have at this particular point in time when we have experienced and are experiencing a pandemic that resilience and vision is definitely something that's important for all of us. And this, this transplant symposium is named after three physicians who embody those particular characteristics of vision and resilience, Dr. Samuel Kuntz, Dr. Clive Callender, and Dr. Charles Drew. So I am so happy to welcome you on behalf of Gift of Life Motep, on behalf of our CEO, who you will hear from tomorrow at Gift of Life Michigan, Ms. Dory Deals, and on behalf of the Detroit Motep Foundation, uh, of which uh, Ms. Patricia White is our current chair. And I also really want to thank um, Tanya Smith and Stacy Brand for their leadership and making sure that, and their resilience and making sure that this transplant symposium that was planned for March uh, continued. And so therefore, even though we're not in person, uh, we're virtually, but realize that we have real uh, concerns. And once again, what a blessing it is that for 10 years that the uh, Gift of Life Motep has been pre present a symposium that focuses on exchange of healthcare disparities and their impact on organ and tissue donation. So I know that the speakers, you'll hear a lot of information. We're excited that you're here. And one again, once again, let me say a special thank you to Tanya and to, uh, Stace, to Stacey Brand. Let me say thank you to those persons kind of behind the scenes uh, today, Jennifer Tislerix and Kenyatta Stevens, and a special uh, thank you to Christine Wise, who designed our wonderful uh, program. So with that, I would say welcome. We're excited that you're here, 10 years strong, and we continue to give you information that we believe impacts not only you, but the communities in which we serve. Thank you. And so back to you, Dr. Danny. Well, thank you, Ramona. And thank you, Tanya and Stacy. And the booklet is extraordinary, uh, put together very, very well and very nicely. Uh, I'd like to introduce our first guest. Um, please refer for a more colorful and detailed uh, explanation uh, of their background in our uh, booklet. Um, I will give a brief introduction. Our first guest is uh, Jerome Eps Espy. Uh, Mr. Espy will be talking about connecting to purpose. Uh, he is a kidney transplant recipient, a peer mentor, a Michigan board mentor, and a member of the Detroit Motep Foundation uh, as well. Mr. Espy. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Denny. It's such an honor to be here today. Uh, I have had such a great experience with Motep and Gift of Life, and just throughout this whole process, it's just been amazing. My, my first interaction with Gift of Life and with uh, organ transplantation was more than a decade ago, and I met Ramona, and um, we were saying at the beginning that uh, everyone in the city of Detroit knows Ramona, and so I had the pleasure of meeting her long before I knew I was going to need, need a kidney, and way back then, I knew that she was an impactful person, and the work that Gift of Life does is 
something that can actually change lives. And so I've been able to experience that firsthand. And so uh, when I think back to uh, my particular journey, uh, coming to today even, I received my kidney on December 12th of 2018. And there was a lot that led up to that. I was uh, diagnosed with uh, high blood pressure and with diabetes. And that's what led to my kidneys uh, driving down as far as the, my function functionality is concerned. And so I was on uh, peritoneal dialysis for two years, and it, uh, it was quite a quite a journey. And uh, you know, there's quite a bit that kind of went into that. And I know that for many people on this call, that's no no surprise. But it was a surprise for me. Uh, there are a lot of things that I could have done uh, that could have prevented me ending up at that place as far as uh, diet, exercise, listening to the doctors when they told me what I was supposed to do. But one of the things that I've learned throughout this process is that there's so much that we can we can control. Uh, and many times, and I know this is uh, pertinent to me, was that at the time when I was told what I was supposed to be doing, I, I thought, well, I can't control this, but I can control what goes in my mouth. And unfortunately, I didn't make the right choices as far as that's concerned. So as I've kind of evaluated everything I've gone through, part of it was me realizing that I had a part in it. And But thankfully, and I was talking this morning, I'm, uh, I'm on a, a group every morning that we get together and we pray and we talk with one another, we encourage one another. And I was talking this morning uh, about extenuating circumstances. And so, uh, for me, my journey really began about a year before I went on on uh, dialysis. And the, that journey was having those discussions with doctors and saying, "Okay, I went from a place of being having the option of, okay, your your numbers are getting bad, and you need to kind of uh, uh, get on this and be more serious about it." To I remember sitting across from the doctor and, and saying. Okay, do you want to do peritoneal dialysis or do you want to do hemodialysis? So it gotten to the point where I didn't have the option anymore. And so that was, that was very sobering. But then when you, you know, you talk about, you know, the, uh, what Dr. Denny was saying is that, you know, we're connecting to purpose. So when I think about purpose, I think about, okay, what all has happened? What all has taken place? And so I went from that place of, okay, you have this choice, hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. And my wife and I, and I thank God every day for my wife. It's, uh, it's great to have a partner, someone that can be with you through the journey. And so she's been there through, through this journey, and it's been amazing. But you know, so I chose peritoneal dialysis, and I was on that dialysis for you know a little little under two years. But then it happened that on April 10th of 2018, after being on dialysis and working with a couple of different hospital systems, that on April 10th I attended a, an event. In Livonia, there's a friend of ours who was having a birthday party, and I found out later that this friend wasn't even really going to invite me to this party. You know, we weren't that close of friends. We since then we've become very good friends, but he decided to invite me to this event, his birthday event. And happenstance, he sat me next to someone else who I had known some years before through our church, and uh, we began to talk. You know, I didn't really want to go to this event. I wasn't feeling well. But I felt encouraged to go. And my wife said, you know, we should go. We should get out of the house. And so we went. And we happened to be sitting next to this gentleman. It's a, it's a uh, Caucasian friend of mine. And I only say that because it's, I think a lot of people think that you can't receive a kidney from a, 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 someone with a, of another race. But I have. But I sat next to this gentleman. And I was telling him what was going on in my life. And without skipping a beat, he said, well, man, if I'm a match, I'd give you a kidney. And so it just kind of blew us away. My wife and I are sitting there. We're looking at each other, and we're just like, did he really say what we just thought when he said? But he had. He had, actually, and he meant it. And so to his credit, that next day, this was, well, actually, the two days later. This was on a Saturday. But on that next Monday, he called up U of M and got tested, began the process. And so fast forward to December 12th of 2018 after a number of tests a lot of different things that kind of went on we sat there and then we were uh we were on the on the gurney sitting next, standing next to each other family and friends around there were some tears there was a lot of encouragement and we you know we kind of went through the whole process and i know that our journey my journey and his journey 
are a little bit different than many people. But I remember that our surgery was after 6 p.m. on one day on the 12th. By noon the next day, my donor, his name was Tiger, Tiger Whitehead. That next day, at noon the next day, he was on his way home. And then two days later, I was on the way home. And so I know that there's a miraculous that takes place in all of our lives. And I know that there's so much that can happen. But I'm thankful that uh, for a purpose. And I'm thankful for people that will listen to an urging. You know, those of us that are spiritual may say that there's, you know, a, uh, a miraculous hand that may be involved in that. But I'm glad that there is a purpose that can come out of any situation. And so I'm thankful that on April 10th, I was able to sit next to a friend of mine who happens to be of a different race, but is, was dedicated enough and heard the vision of what he should do. Uh, I had talked to, I've talked to a number of uh, mentors throughout the process of going through this whole donation process and receiving a kidney. Uh, Actually, I had three, three mentors. Two of them passed away, unfortunately. But still, you know, one of the things that I you know, continued and was able to do is to, to listen to them and to, to really enjoy the process and learn through the process. Because I've just learned so much throughout this whole thing. So now when I look around, you know, of course, I'm still on medications, but I'm doing so much better. I feel vibrant. I feel like my life is back, has been given back to me. And so one of the first things I did more than a decade ago was you know, begin to think, man, how can I help this organization? And so shortly after I was diagnosed and learned that I was going to go on dialysis, I you know, contacted Ramona, like, hey, this is, uh, uh, I'm going to have to get a kidney. I'm going to have to go on dialysis. And, and Ramona said, well, okay, we're going to have to get you involved. And I think that's part of Ramona's DNA is that, okay, when she meets someone, she's like, okay, hi, how are you? I'm Ramona. And then the next thing I think she's thinking, how can I get you involved? <laughs> and, and, but I thank God for, for, you know, for everything that she has done. But you know, so, I, so since then, you know, I, I volunteer at the you know, University of Michigan Hospital, and then I volunteer for National Kidney Foundation. I uh, uh, volunteer. I'm on the board of um, of MoTeP. So there's so much. There's such a great opportunity that we can all take if we take the if we hear what we would call that still small voice and pursue our purpose. That purpose is exciting. You know, we all have opportunities in our lives. We pursue different things. We pursue career goals. We pursue relationship goals. And it's all for, okay, so what is it all for? What is it that we can do? A lot of the statistics that, you, you know, we're going to hear over the next couple of days, the stories we're going to hear, and this is a, you know, a group of, uh, auspicious group of doctors and founders and people that have great titles and have done great things in their lives. But anyone can actually make a difference. Anyone can actually have a purpose and take their life to another level. When you think about any one of us, if you had the opportunity to save 75 people by yourself without a cape on, would you do it? And so this is something that I always, when I'm having conversations about my journey, I try to tell them, tell people this, is that you don't have to have a cape to make a difference. Each one of us, through our organs and tissues, can save up to 75 people. 75 people, if you think about that. And so it's really amazing to know that uh, we, can, we have that opportunity and then we should always make sure that we are looking for an opportunity to pursue our purpose. And so that's what this whole thing is about, empowering the transplant community with resilience and vision. And then also I would add, if I, if I could add a word on, I would say, and with purpose. And so we all have a purpose that we can, we can actually step into. And so it takes courage to step into purpose. It takes purpose to move forward and to do the things that we are designed to do and we have an opportunity for. So I'm so grateful and thankful to be able to be here, so grateful and thankful to be able to stand and to live. And I wake up every morning with two things, and it's uh, not trying to offend anyone that doesn't believe as I do, I believe. But the first thing I do when I wake up every morning is I say, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. The second thing I do is I pray for my donor, Tiger Whitehead. And I'm thankful because I'm going to call with him every day. And so I'm able to express my gratitude towards him. I'm able to talk to him and, and to, you know, and I, I was able to talk this morning on our call about extenuating circumstances. And so the whole concept of extenuating circumstances is that there's something that's supposed to happen, but there's a, and it's something, something that intervenes and causes our lives to go off in a different direction. And so I'm in the, I am thankful to be, to be able to exemplify that. 
is that there were extenuating circumstances through my brother Tiger Whitehead that led me to be able to sit here today and to be able to be a part of this great, great symposium. I think about the doctors that are involved here. I think about the doctors at, uh, at my hospital, which is University of Michigan Hospital. And uh, my sports affiliation is on the other side of the state, but my commitment uh, affiliation is with University of Michigan. So I'm, so I'm so grateful to the doctors there. I'm grateful for everyone that has done anything to sow into my life, including my brother Tiger Whitehead. But I'm also thankful for the opportunity to be able to take a portion of my testimony or my story, as many of us would say, and to be able to encourage someone else. I was having a conversation with another uh, fraternity brother of mine yesterday who is, uh, who is unfortunately also on this journey and he's, he's having to go through, he's on dialysis now. He started out with peritoneal dialysis, but now he's transferred over to hemodialysis and he is, uh, he's in Toledo and here in Michigan and in Toledo that's trying to get, trying to get set up for a kidney. And he is talking about just the challenges. He's gone through, he's had four different calls of uh, waiting for, a, you know, of thinking that he was going to get a kidney. So uh, another part of this journey, and I believe a part of the purpose, is uh, for me to be able to encourage other people. So, you know, we spend an hour on the phone just kind of talking uh, and just, in, just being able to encourage him and say, look, okay, this does not have to be the end. Make sure your mindset is right. Make sure that you have a purpose in mind beyond where you are today. Uh, another part of this whole thing as far as being a, um, in this time of COVID-19, um, I laughed to myself because after the surgery on December 12th, 2018, I was walking around with masks on. I had uh, hand sanitizer with me and people were looking at me like I was crazy. Like, okay, why, do you, why does he have a mask on? What, what's going on? What's going on? But now everybody's got to wear a mask. Everybody has to use <laughs> Uh, hand sanitizer and they're wiping off things. And so they're wiping off chairs, they're wiping off carts when they go into the grocery store. So the world condition has moved everyone into what has become my world. So I have to be care. I'd be very careful, obviously, about what I touch, where I go, what I do. But I'm grateful and I'm thankful. And uh, I'm also grateful and thankful that people have an understanding now of how important it is to be clean, how important it is to be able to, uh, to, to cough into your arm and to, to be careful about what you're doing. So I just wanted to take a brief moment to encourage someone out there that is looking and, you know, even the, 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 the professionals that do the work in this area of transplantation, that the work of your hands provides miracles for lives. And so I, I'm grateful for that and thankful for it. And also, I'm so honored to be able to be able to, to lead into our next speaker, who's, a, who's an icon in this, in this space. But uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to contributing for a long and prosperous life. And I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Espy. As we all uh, uh, appreciate your kind words and how to connect the purpose, your faith-based uh, uh, assessment. You were really giving us the good news straight from the gospel. And we're appreciative of that. Um, I, I had a few comments, uh, as, I, as I usually do. You, you mentioned the University of, and, and of Michigan and the, the defined surgeons there and and um you know good surgeons football team eh? you know right <laughs> <laughs> uh, more for more of a buckeye man myself but i digress i digress i digress uh we will do no slander uh only one every five minutes only one every five minutes so mr Espy, um thank you very much for setting the tone for our symposium and you know as the original uh, uh speaker and as an actual patient i think that you bring uh perspectives that you know we don't often have. One of the greatest things that I've gotten out of the Detroit Motep Foundation is that when you speak to doctors all day, there's a certain perspective. It's very science-based. How are we going to approach this case? How are we going to get the vessels? What kind of kidneys should we use? Immunology, all these wonderful things. But at the end of the day, as I teach my students, the only reason you're doing any of this is so that you can meet the patient's needs. So being able to speak to patients really rounds out my care plan and my perspective as, as a physician. So if you had to think of maybe one thing, a key message that you would give that's essential for the audience uh, from a patient perspective, what would, you, what would you say succinctly that they could take home? The one thing that I would say, and I say this all the time, is listen to your doctor. And the, the, the three words that are the, the, 
the bane of most people's existence is I deserve it. So they make a decision, okay, I'm going through this and I should eat this, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, I deserve it. And so I would say that listen to your doctor, do what they tell you to do and live a long life. Okay, excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. So we're going to uh, uh, move on and I'm going to introduce, um, you know, uh, for the younger people, we call them OG in this. Uh, for the older people, we use formal words like uh, iconic status. Um, especially for me, uh, being a uh, black transplant surgeon, you know, when I came into this, you know, position, you know, there's very few of us, you know, 50 or 60 or so at this point. Uh, and Dr. Callender, I believe, was the second. So it's very important to know where you fit in as I tell my children. What's your legacy? What is it that you need to fulfill? Whose shoes are you walking in? Who came before you to kind of pave the way for you uh, scientifically, socially, uh, and otherwise? Um, so let me introduce Dr. Callender. Dr. Clive O. Callender, um, fellow of the American College of Surgeons, um, began national uh, MOTEP to increase um, organ donation in minority communities, uh, has done that uh, by the numbers, has educated other communities uh, as well, has um, given us advances in histopathology and how we um, um, allocate organs uh, based on tissue to um, African-Americans in the United States, um, was professor of surgery at Howard University uh, and doing kidney transplants in Washington, DC uh, for many years. Um, is a wonderful uh, speaker, a wealth of knowledge, and I can't wait to hear what he has to say for us today, Dr. Calder. Hello, how are you? Uh, I wanted to say a couple of things before I really start my presentation, because it is now uh, 10 years since uh, this uh, session began. We're talking about uh, the Kuntz calendar drew symposium and it's been a delight to participate for these 10 years but uh, the thing that uh, I thought about as we approach the 10th year that maybe I should say a few things about uh, Dr. Kuntz and uh, Charles Drew because uh, I'm probably one of the few people who actually uh, uh, spent a lot of time with uh, Sam Kuntz. Uh, he was the uh, actually first African-American transplant surgeon in the United States and one of the most powerful uh, figures in the country. Uh, many don't realize that uh, we talk about resilience today, <laughs> that uh, Sam uh, decided at eight he wanted to be a doctor, but he, he, his grades in high school were so, so poor that he really had to take remedial classes just to get into college. And then after getting into college, uh, he uh, uh, had a lot of snags along the way. But in the final analysis, he uh, was able to get into, become the first uh, African-American at, at University of Kansas to get into Kansas Medical School, University of Arkansas Medical School. Uh, thereafter, uh, he had done so many things that uh, sometimes I've forgotten that as an African-American, uh, we're, we're first. Uh, he was among the first to do transplants among non-twins. Uh, in 1961. And uh, that's a historical uh, fact that many people aren't aware of. Uh, he also uh, was uh, the person who developed uh, the use of methylprednisolone uh, to reverse rejection, uh, which is uh, now taken for granted. But he was the first to do that. In addition, uh, in uh, 19... I guess 1961, he was the one who actually did the first transplant on non-twins, uh, which uh, was historical. That's just one of the many things he did. Uh, and then uh, he performed the first successful kidney transplant in the Middle East. And uh, he, along with Fred Belser, developed a machine that is used for preservation in the United States and, and probably all over the world. Uh, one of the other things he did that was interesting was that he performed a live kidney transplant on the Today Show in an effort to advocate organ donation. This inspired 20,000 viewers to offer their kidneys for donation. <clears throat> By his death in 1981, when he was 51, 
He had performed around 500 kidney transplants, the most performed by any doctor at that time. What many people are not aware of, because there's myths about uh, Kuntz as they are about Drew. And the myth was that uh, he died from some brain disease. Well, I happen to be on the inside and I know the facts, which were never actually revealed. He actually died from uh, complications of something as simple as high blood pressure. Had uh, very bad high blood pressure, which required him to take medications that caused him to have convulsion and have anoxia, which damaged his brain. Uh, so he didn't have any virus infection or anything like that. He actually had uh, treatment for his high blood pressure that uh, caused him to have a convulsion uh, because he was difficult to intubate. He developed cerebral anoxia, which is, one, which is why he died at the young age of uh, 50. One of the things about these pictures of the three people that are, are there, you see that I'm the only one that lived long. Uh, uh, the next person I'm gonna talk about is uh, actually Charles Drew, uh, who actually is uh, one of my, my surgical fathers. Uh, because I, I trained at Howard University, and everything you you hear about is Charles Drew. And one of the first things that uh, we learn uh, is that uh, the excellence of performance will transcend artificial barriers created by man. Again, excellence of performance will transcend artificial barriers created by man. Uh, we're in a pandemic now, and this is a pandemic that we talk a lot about, but what we don't recognize is that the mother of pandemics was in 1918. And in that pandemic, 55 million human beings were affected by that pandemic. 15 million died. Uh, one of those 15 million was Charles Drew's sister. And this had an impact upon Charles and that led him to want to go into medicine. As we talk about resilient people, uh, Charles Drew uh, actually is interesting. He went to Amherst and uh, tried to get into Howard, but because of his uh, lack of credits in English, he couldn't get into Howard. So he got accepted to, to uh, uh, McGill University in Canada, where he finished his uh, medical training with honors. Uh, then it's, it's interesting how many people who applied to Howard never got in, but uh, became great, great people. And uh, Charles Drew was one of them. Then he did his work uh, after McGill. Uh, uh, he, he went to Columbia, where he worked with Scudder, who uh, actually developed, uh, he and Scudder together de developed the whole blood plasma uh, scheme, which uh, became the uh, bl blood plasma, which saved so many millions of lives. We talk about transplantation. In many ways, transfusion is one of the first transplants. And uh, the blood plasma work that he did was so outstanding uh, that uh, uh, he uh, received the Spangon Medal. But what many people also don't know about Charles Drew is that while he was the founder of the blood plasma program that saved many lives, he had to resign from the Red Cross because the old enemy, uh, racism. They decided that uh, the blood product should be segregated and only blacks should receive blood from blacks. And because of this, he resigned. And uh, uh, so his legacy is, 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 is interesting. The other myth about uh, Charles Drew that makes it similar to uh, uh, Sam Coons is the myth that he died because he couldn't get his own blood blood plasma, blood transfusion, sorry. Actually he had such a massive uh, accident that nothing would have saved him and he did not need a blood transfusion. So that's the myth about it. Now, can we go to the first slide, please? I just thought I would share that because uh, it's so important to know about some of these people and give a little uh, uh, idea about uh, what, uh, who they were and, and the humanity, humanitarian aspect of their lives. Now, my talk is related to the MOTEP journey to live donations. And in January of 2018, uh, Tangela Purnell published her article, and she discussed it actually in the 2019 uh, Kunst uh, Drew Symposium. And uh, it identified a decrease in live donors among the African-American and Latino Hispanic populations. 
and this inspired me, next slide, uh, to uh, develop a national minority strategic plan for increasing donations in African Americans and Latino Hispanics, with an emphasis on applying the successful strategies <coughs> that have been used to increase de de deceased minority donation rates between 1991 and 2017. And, and this involved uh, us addressing the uh, uh, love yourself, take care of yourself, and the going from awareness to action to accountability, uh, emphasizing not em awareness, but emphasizing the outcome, increasing donation rates. Uh, second is that removing obstacles to living donor workups which are identified by previous kidney and liver donors, which is that navigational uh, obstacles are the big problem in terms of identifying a navigator to take uh, a donor from one spot to another and to get the work up done in uh, as early a fashion as possible. Also, uh, emphasize looking into a new minority paradigm, which uh, I think is important, and that is to have uh, uh, transplant professionals going into elementary schools, uh, junior high schools, high schools, uh, so that early on they understand uh, that minorities can and will and do make a difference in transplantation. And this is something that uh, uh, we can do very well. Now, we've developed a message that we think is important for all to adopt. Uh, I mentioned before about awareness to action and to accountability especially as it now relates to living organ donors. We've done a lot of work in the, with the deceased donors, but we need to do more in uh, uh, living donors. And uh, we put together eight informational items that we think are important to share. Uh, first is that, sadly, because of the fact that we do only 40,000 transplants a year, at least that's the most we've ever done, and we have 110,000 people waiting for transplants. Uh, and therefore, 22 Americans died daily because of the organ donor shortage. So that's something we must work on. Secondly, and this is a, a fact that we don't often like to publicize, is that the death rate on dialysis for patients with end-stage renal disease is 100 times higher than that of renal transplant patients. And this message we must get across because Transplantation is the treatment of choice for end-stage renal disease. Patients on the transplant waiting list have waiting times which range from five to 10 years in, 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 some, in many locations. Uh, the next slide shows that uh, living donor waiting times, on the other hand, range from 30 to 60 days, depending upon how fast you can get worked up. Fifthly, the success rate for living donor transplant grass survival rates are 10 to 20 percent higher than for deceased donor transplant. So uh, the uh, long-term success rate is good for both, but uh, the living donor success is much better. Communication, community education and empowerment uh, has taken deceased African-American organ donor rates from the bottom in 1982 to the top between 2010 and 2017. This is something I'm very proud of, the fact that they said we couldn't donate, and lo and behold, we, we've gotten to the top for deceased donation. Uh, however, living donor rates in our populations, African Americans and Latino and Hispanic populations, have decreased between 1995 and 2014, and this is so important. And then finally, the emphasis on living donation has to be a new priority for us as we look forward. Uh, next slide points out that there are three things we must therefore do as we move forward. Uh, uh, we must encourage as many end-stage renal disease patients as possible to begin looking for living donors. It's a wonderful story that Jerome presented, Ms. Espy presented to us to show that ethnicity is irrelevant. Uh, what we need is a donor, whether it's black, white, green, or purple. It's a new mandate that we must highlight the use of grassroots face-to-face -face presentations, as well as multimedia and social media campaigns. Uh, with the coronavirus now, uh, it's interesting how we're gonna be able to accomplish this. But to accomplish this, we must. Looking at the donor rates on uh, African-American, Latino, Hispanics, and Caucasians, we identify what uh, 
uh, Tanjala had told us before that uh, we, we've got a long way to go in terms of increasing donation rates among Latinos and uh, African Americans. And as we look at the National Living Donor Assistance Program, which has done a lot so far, and this is something that we can do even more. For example, their data relieved that 16% of, of the participants were African American and 17% were Latino Hispanics. And I think that uh, we should do what we can to increase these numbers by allowing the transplant programs to know when you have a live donor so that the financial incentives or disincentives can be removed from, uh, trans from uh, uh, donation. And this then will allow us to increase that. I think, uh, can you go back one slide? I think I missed something there. Yeah, okay, and you're right. The next slide then does show that uh, uh, we must eliminate the navigational obstacles. You know, you know Dr. Purnell's paper identified these and uh, Jamie Locke looked in detail in Alabama and identified the many obstacles which can be removed by having a navigator uh, 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 appointed for each uh, live donor. Uh, that's asking a lot, but uh, in order for us to change things, we've got to do things that are sometimes difficult. And then uh, use ethnically and, and culturally similar and sensitive messengers uh, uh, for and from our communities where face-to-face, -face, grassroots, social media, and multimedia approaches focus on increasing live donor translation rates. Uh, the next slide uh, uh, brings up an issue <clears throat> that has become something we discuss a lot, and that is the significance of the genetics as it relates to uh, transplantation. There's data uh, that the genotypes, the APL1 and MYH9 genes, if you have similarity on both genes, that is homogeneity, uh, then you are likely to have uh, increased rejection rates. And some feel that uh, if you're uh, African-American and you have both genes that uh, possess APOL1 and MYH9, you should not uh, be transplanted. If you have only one gene, there is no obstacle. However, uh, we are now involved in, in work that Barry Freeman has led from the Wake Forest Group uh, that uh, is being done nationally to give us an answer to the question. Because in many, many instances, some people think that this may be decreasing live donors, but the results are not in yet. The next thing we have to do is to identify how many sites are necessary for the National Strategic Plan to work. And MOTAP, AMAT, and DLA, and the OPOs uh, need to be involved in terms of identifying this. Interesting work that uh, Keith Melanson in Washington, D.C. has been doing is he's used a local rather than national regional exchange donations along with uh, plasmapheresis and other desensitizing efforts. And as a consequence, he's increased the uh, uh, minority donation rate from 11%, which it is nationally, where at his program in, in, in DC, it's 46%. So uh, I think we need to find out exactly what he's doing and we can do it similarly uh, in other locations. Now, here comes the, the, the job. We're talking about a lot of things here, but what about the impact of coronavirus on what we've done? Uh, it's true that coronavirus has brought fear to the face-to-face -face community education methodology, which has been the optimal way in my, my view to overcome distrust. And so therefore we must find a new or old ways to encourage the community's trust. And therefore we have to use some new and old technologies that, uh, uh, for example, using Zoom, Skype, live streaming into churches, fraternities, sororities, and other community local, other community social groups with community liaisons. Uh, this becomes even more important to have the liaison to open as a portal to open the doors to, to areas that we have are not able to get into person to person. Uh, although I would argue that uh, we, we still can get in 
to the person to person. But we'll talk about that a little later because nobody wants to hear that. But refocusing on the use of the radio, the free press, and newsletters that reach the community where they are, because uh, uh, this is something that uh, has been our mainstay. Identifying traditional and non-traditional groups to open doors for us to educate and reach the unreachable. Using traditional and untraditional groups, uh, smaller groups, yes, but groups nonetheless, to educate and teach the so-called unreachable. Those who are computer illiterate or have no computer or do not engage in social media. And this may represent 10 to 20% of the population in some areas. The next slide. Finally, while the coronavirus has forced us to identify ways to combat institutionalized racism and its symptoms, remember these are just symptoms of the disease, Police, police brutality, health disparities, and inequalities in all areas. We cannot hesitate to use our innovative and creative energies in an era we can change, increasing living donations. 20 people still die daily because of the organ donor shortage, and there is much that we can do about it. Uh, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to express some of my uh, sentiments that I have with great passion. Thank you very much. The comments, I'm always appreciative to hear you speak. Uh, I'm so always happy to uh, get the little tidbits. Always better when we're one-on-one, -on -one, walking through the hallways of ASTS. <laughs> I can get a little history lesson. But I thank you very much for the walk through history. I think it's very important for people to understand um, things that you just don't hear from everybody else and, and the contributions people make. And sometimes when you see yourself in the history, it allows you to feel more like you belong. And I see that with young residents, whether it's female residents or male residents, anybody who doesn't feel like they're in the mainstream, uh, nonetheless. Uh, I also very appreciative how um, we are transitioning, adding on living uh, donating, living kidney uh, donation. We started the Center for Living Donation at Henry Ford uh, over the last few years where we really focus on, on the donor and the donor care. Uh, so I spend much of my time doing that. And I think that is the next frontier because there will not be a waiting list if you have a donor. Uh, you do not have to go through dialysis and donors live very well. They go home pretty much the next day. Uh, so I think that is a great uh, message. So let me ask you this question. Do, have you found it more difficult or less difficult to educate the communities on uh, live uh, kidney donation uh, versus deceased kidney donation? Uh, there's still, I find it more difficult. And the reason is because uh, people still are very distrustful about whether or not we are really interested in their welfare. And, but I, when you get a chance in the old days, we got a chance to talk one-on-one -on -one, uh, and you really break it down. Uh, most people are willing to consider it. One of the off biggest obstacles, as you know well, is our own health. And we talk about loving yourself, take care of yourself. But uh, as, as Jerome indicated, very often we don't do that. And as a consequence, uh, uh, many of the pro potential donors aren't healthy enough to be donors. And that is a major obstacle in the in the, the minority community is that many of the people you'd want to be donors. And that's why uh, I think uh, Keith Melanson's program in uh, DC uh, offers an option to those people who who aren't healthy enough to be donors, but have other people who don't have the same blood type and other things uh, that can be transplanted differently. Uh, but uh, that's a long-winded answer to the question, which is, yes, I find it a little more difficult, but I think when you can get them one-on-one, -on -one, uh, it becomes easier. Uh, with the coronavirus now uh, uh, impacting upon our ability to do the one-on-ones, it makes it even harder. Yeah, the coronavirus certainly has affected us, affected our patients. It affected my hair choices, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> but we all definitely need to uh, need to need to need to be safe. Uh, from our uh, questions on the outside, um, Robbie Gass has mentioned that Dr. Kuntz is a proud native of Arkansas, 
and a graduate of, of the uh, um, Arkansas uh, University, uh, like uh, like him. Uh, and many people are mentioning about uh, Keith uh, Keith Melanson's work at GW. Uh, let me ask you a question: Would you like to touch on any innovations in terms of um, letting people know? I will give you a brief example. So, ten years ago, maybe even fifteen years ago, people would come to me and say, "Doc, uh, I need to get on the list." That was the thing; they just get on the list. And I thought at that time that was sufficient. Um, we did a lot of effort, and then you know, not everybody gets off the list. So, the example I give them, being from New York, and I know you're from New York as well. I said, well, you know, in the old days when I actually went to a nightclub, do they still exist, a nightclub? <laughs> uh, you'd get on the line. Big guy would come out front and be like, you, you, you. You got nice clothes. She's pretty. You come in. So you're on the line, but it doesn't mean you're going to get in. So I tell my patients that just because you get listed, that's only the initial step. A live donor is your ticket to actually not be on dialysis and, and to get off dialysis. Um, and they may come with a donor, and that donor will say, oh, our blood types don't match. Okay, uh, I'm out. And I say, no, 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 no. There's many ways that you can help. You want to share any bit, tidbits about that? Well, I, I think that uh, uh, it is important that all programs are as, as uh, aware as you are that, uh, uh, you know, in the old days, if you were the different blood type, you were contraindicated. If you had a uh, high sensitivity, uh, if you had a lot of antibodies, uh, you couldn't be transplanted. And now because of the fact that you can uh, exchange donors and you can do plasmapheresis and you can use medications that uh, uh, eliminate those obstacles, uh, many of the so-called untransplantables are now transplantable. Yeah, absolutely. And we do things that are commonly known in the community as swaps. Uh, you know, if you have your sister would like to donate to you and she cannot, I have another person in the next room who your sister can donate to and her sister can donate to you. Everybody's off dialysis and you get an equally uh, uh, good kidney. And I think that that has helped us a lot because of uh, some of the barriers with medications, uh, having to up them uh, when you go across um, high sensitivity patients or blood barriers. A question from the community is, uh, and you briefly touched on this. Can you mention what you think are the three top barriers to living kidney donation in the African-American community? I'd say the first one is uh, lack of appreciation to the fact that uh, we are, uh, that our rates are decreasing rather than increasing. That'd be number one. We're not aware of that. Number two is uh, now that we have the uh, coronavirus, the ability to get into the community and actually educate and empower. I think one of the most important obstacles is uh, uh, the fact that uh, people need to overcome that distrust that is uh, strong. Uh, and I guess the third uh, is uh, probably uh, the, the fact that uh, we as uh, transplant personnel uh, often aren't willing to take the steps to make sure that the navigational obstacles are uh, eliminated or reduced. Uh, I found that navigation is one of the biggest obstacles to uh, live donation. And so uh, when you assign a navigator to each uh, uh, person, if you can, I think this then would address the three barriers that I think are most crucial to overcome for live donations in the African American and Latino Hispanic populations. Well, Dr. Callender, I want to thank you as always for your time, your sage wisdom. You gave me new information today uh, that I can go look up and uh, uh, and uh, uh, spill out on my team and my residents when I'm teaching. We well, thank you much for your day uh, and, and being with us. My pleasure. It's always good to see you. All right. Awesome. Uh, we're going to move on. I just have a few a few housekeeping notes. I want to refer everybody to my hairstyle in my uh, in the uh, booklet. There, you can see the, the 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 old Dr. Denny refined and and smooth as usual, uh, and not my Corona hairstyle, which you know, kind of getting used to. All right. I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Daniel Dawes. Mr. Dawes is an attorney and a professor of health, law, and policy, and the director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute um, at Morehouse School of Medicine. Mr. Dawes. 
Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, Dr. Danny. Can you all hear me? Dr. Danny, can you hear me? Definitely can hear you. They X me out when you're on, but I can Oh, hear they you. do? Okay, so we're good. All right, just want to make sure I'm not talking and no one can hear. But, you know, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, Dr. Danny, for that generous introduction. I, I want to thank Gift of Life uh, Motep again for hosting this important conversation. It has been a a long friend of mine, Ramonia and Tanya, and of course, it's an honor to follow uh, Dr. Callender, who's been a trailblazer in this movement. And today I wanna you know, talk about how we can move beyond merely nibbling around the edges of the problem of racial health inequities in the United States, and how we can implement meaningful change. Today we're gonna look at, look at how, you know, we're gonna really venture further upstream and look at how these inequities have been concretized in our structures, in our systems, in our communities over time, and what we can do about them, harnessing the power of the uh, political determinants of health. So without further ado, let us begin. We know that for too long, many racial and ethnic minorities um, and other vulnerable and marginalized uh, groups have, have found themselves in a precarious situation. Their health, their lives, literally hanging into balance, many of them falling through the cracks of our health system, our educational systems, our behavioral health system, human services system, employment systems, you name it. They struggle to live in a society that has intentionally erected barrier after barrier to weaken their bodies and hasten their deaths. For over 400 years, these groups have experienced inequities throughout the life course from womb to tomb. And we all know that these inequities in health status and healthcare are widely documented. We know that we have over 7,000 peer reviewed journal articles highlighting these. And you see a list of um, some of those on your screen. So I wanna share a story with you, highlighting what I think is an incredible case for why we must continue to push for health equity, not only in Michigan, but across the country. And why with the privilege and the power that each of us have, that we must use it to advance the cause. It started with a headache in late March. Then came the body aches. At first, Shalandra Rollins's doctor thought that it was the flu. By April 7, three days after she was finally diagnosed with COVID-19, the 38-year-old teaching assistant who had two years earlier managed to beat the odds, having lacked health insurance at times in her adulthood, working in low paying jobs, experiencing limited access to care, told her mom that she was feeling winded. Within an hour, she was in an ambulance, conscious but struggling to breathe, bound for a hospital in Jackson, Mississippi. An hour later, she was pronounced dead. Shalandra Rollins, a mother of two, had a number of factors that put her at high risk of dying from COVID-19. As Dr. Callender was mentioning, you know, like her mother, she had a pre-existing condition. She was black with a low salary job and few resources. To date, we've lost at least 38,000 black lives to COVID-19. And the majority of these individuals had an underlying health condition. We know that the underlying factors such as cancer, asthma, heart disease, lung disease, and other chronic diseases strike disproportionately within communities of color. As a result, these communities experience a greater risk or are at greater risk of complications from COVID-19. The inequities that predate COVID did not suddenly appear, right? Nor are they inapplicable. Minorities, people with disabilities and other vulnerable communities still contend with neighborhoods that are largely devoid of necessary health protective and health sustaining resources. And they still contend with the political determinants or drivers that created, perpetuated, and exacerbated these health inequities. We know that racial and ethnic minorities, people with disabilities, lower socioeconomic status individuals, LGBTQ plus individuals, and individuals living in rural communities die disproportionately each year. And it's costing us over $300 billion, a very conservative number. But the one thing that we must always remember is that in the United States, the nation's health 
is not an organic outcome. It's not a coincidence that certain groups of Americans experience higher premature death rates or poor health outcomes than others. Why? Why is this happening? Today, we recognize that a variety of forces collectively impact our health and determine the quality and the extent of our lives on this earth. These include, of course, the social determinants of health, the environmental determinants, economic, behavioral health, healthcare, and genetic factors. It is true that air pollution, climate change, toxic waste sites, unclean water, lack of fresh fruits and vegetables, unsafe, unsecure, and unstable housing, poor quality education, inaccessible transportation, lack of parks and other recreational areas, you know, and other factors play an outsized role in our overall health and well-being. They increase our stress, they expose us to harmful elements, and they limit our opportunities to thrive. These social determinants of health play an outsized role in these human-made pre-existing inequities. But underlying each one is a political determinant that we can no longer ignore. Too often we stop at these social determinants or drivers of inequities, failing to dig even deeper to see the depths of the problem and understand its root causes and distribution. And as a result, we miss the link between the social determinants of health and their political roots. So I wanna illustrate this with a short story. If you were to envision all of society sitting on the banks of a mighty river, or since we're in Michigan, you know, the banks of a great lake, fishing and finding nourishment in the resources that the river provides. The health inequities that we observe or face are represented by the differences in the caliber and the quantity of fish we encountered. Some people have a bounty of healthy fish and vegetation to feed off of, while others may only have small fish, no vegetation or malnourished fish. Different people having access to different types of resources and different parts of the river represent the social determinants of health. Some people are located in a slower moving part of the river by no fault of their own. Others are located in more lush parts of the river and benefit because of such by specific decisions that were made on their behalf. These are the political determinants of health. Somewhere, somewhere upstream, Decisions were made to divert the river to benefit certain groups of people and harm others. And decisions were made to place certain types of people on specific banks of the river while placing others elsewhere. These upstream determinants have downstream impacts. You see, this pandemic demonstrates the inconvenient and harsh truth about the impact of social determinants of health and how collectively these factors significantly contribute to our society's health inequities. It shows a compounding effect of political determinants over personal responsibility. Let me repeat that. It shows the compounding effect of political determinants over personal responsibility. Because no, because no matter how much many African Americans, Native Americans, Native Hawaiians, Latinx Americans, Pacific Islander Americans, and others try to act responsibly. There are always structural, institutional, interpersonal, and even intrapersonal obstacles hindering them. Beneath these communities notice have been political determinants pulling and continuing to pull strings that prevent them from achieving their health and full potential. And so it's no wonder why COVID has not been striking all communities equally because our economic and social policies have not been benefiting all equally. Think about who's been able to get access to testing, right? Who gets access to healthcare and the quality of care? Who's more likely to have a chronic condition that increases their risk of more serious COVID-19 outcomes? Who can afford to shelter at home safely? Who can access transportation? Even issues as accessing water, accessing food, all are political determinants of health. So Shalandra's story, in effect, highlights how one political determinant after another resulted in a continual tightening of a chokehold on her community and the eventual disaster that brought to light the inequities plaguing it. 
high obesity rates, diabetes, maternal mortality, depression, and many other health issues can be firmly linked back to political action or inaction. By understanding the political determinants of health, their origins, their impact, and their interconnection with the social determinants of health, we'll be better able and better equipped to develop and implement actionable solutions to close the health gap. You see, what Shalandra's story shows us is that behind virtually every health disparity and subsequent death, especially during this time of COVID-19, there were specific and insidious political determinants of health that led to the person's premature death. So for a moment, I wanna paint a picture of the tree of health for you. Initially, you may notice a tree, the fruit, the individuals, and even the tombstones surrounding this tree. But actually, this picture is far more representative of what our society currently has to offer some of its most vulnerable people. The tree represents society. You see, there have always been co-laborers in the fight for health equity. Many of you, in fact, have been co-laborers who have tended to this tree. We have worked tirelessly to feed the tree evidence-based policies, programs, and practices with the hope that the tree would provide fruit that would benefit all of society. However, the reality is that there have been others who've been working over time to supply the tree with that which would do it harm. These are the roots that are undergirded by racism, classism, sexism, and many other deleterious motives. From the bottom of the tree's base, all the way up and through to the ends of its branches, what is supplied to the tree eventually is multiplied by the tree. So now due to the root causes of inequities, the fruit represents higher rates of diabetes, inaccessible safe and secure housing, a lack of nutritious food, and any other number of those outcomes that we know as the social determinants of health. And as that poisonous and sometimes rotted fruit falls to the ground, the tree that had the potential to provide life-giving nourishment to all who encountered it now only, uh, now only leaves death and destruction in its shadow from one generation to the next. So now I want you to imagine what could and should have been. The roots of the tree, which anchors the tree and is supposed to absorb nutrients from the soil, represent the political determinants of health. And the detrimental factors that the tree's roots were absorbing include racism, sexism, classism, and many other evils. Every political and policy decision that is made feeds into the tree yielding fruit which permeates throughout our society. But if the tree of health is rooted in health equity, the end result is a society that is nourished, cared for, and capable of achieving its full potential. Shalandra's story is not just a truly tragic story. It's a reminder that her death was not only preventable, but downright avoidable, if only she had been fed by a tree of health that bore life-sustaining fruit. So how did we get here, right? We know that inequality gets under our skin. It leads to accelerated aging or biological weathering, as Dr. Arlene Geronimus at the University of Michigan has pointed. And it increases our rates of chronic diseases over time as researchers have identified. So think about it this way, right? Think about a, a cement block and a drip of water continually dripping down on that cement block. At first, we don't notice the impact that it's having on the individual block. But over time, with that constant drip, it starts to wear away at the concrete. That's essentially what is happening in many black and brown bodies today, right? At the ends of our DNA, when we look at the telomeres, when we look at the advanced aging, and you were to look at a black man who's 40 and a, black, and a white man who's 40, you will notice that there is increased aging in the black man's body. We know that research, epigenetic research, has shown us that um, there's been intergenerational trauma over time, again, wearing away at our bodies. And they've been able to uh, show the link from over 401 years ago. So today I want to quickly talk about big P policy and little p policy, right? The main instigators of these inequities, big P policy being governmental policies, little p policies being non-governmental policies, right, or commercial policies. 
So when you go back 401 years um, ago, we know that, as we've just discussed, the social determinants play an outsized role in our health, right? These structural conditions in which we live, in which we work, uh, in which we were born into in many cases, right? And they do have an impact. But let's tie that now to the policies that created the mess we're in. If you go back into the 1600s, after Massachusetts was the first colony to legalize slavery, what we saw afterwards, of course, were other colonies um, pursuing or developing and implementing similar laws. But we also saw immediately after policies that were designed to prohibit black and indigenous populations from raising their own food, from earning their own money, from learning to read and write, from congregating, socializing with one another. Uh, there were laws prohibiting them from going out at night unless they had a lantern, going out into the community unless they had passes. And the list goes on and on and on. We know that these policies then were recycled from one generation to the next, one century to the next. And we find ourselves at a period, right, when we finally got, after 75 years, after the US government was established, 75 years after that, an incredible opportunity to develop a policy that would address these social determinants of health, the Freedmen's Bureau Act in 1863. It would take two years of negotiation to get that up and to be passed. It finally worked. But the forces, the forces that oppose health equity, again, were working diligently to undermine that policy. We know that they undermine not only the Freedmen's Bureau Act, the most comprehensive health reform, or health policy addressing the social determinants, but all of the major civil rights legislation at that time that President Abraham Lincoln and his supporters had managed to get done. We know afterwards that Jim Crow reared its ugly head. And afterwards there were policies, right? That intentionally segregated the United States. We know then that after those intentionally discriminatory policies, there was an attempt by, by government, by policymakers to move beyond those discriminatory uh, policies or facially discriminatory to facially neutral, right? They didn't appear to explicitly discriminate against a group of people, but they did have a disparate impact on communities of people, and that was intentionally designed. We know that there was an uh, effort by the FDR administration, Franklin D. Roosevelt administration, to go out into communities across the nation, over 200 communities, and to basically collect data on them, working in concert with state and municipal policymakers to grade these neighborhoods in a, in a certain city. So as you see three of the cities in your state um, that were redlined from Detroit to Grand Rapids to Flint, um, interesting stuff there. So you know, red obviously represents what they call the most hazardous communities. These were your primarily African-American communities. The yellow were your primarily immigrant communities. These were undesirable immigrant communities and they were deemed uh, way less desirable than the white, more affluent communities. We know that if you were green or blue, those were, of course, rated as desirable um, communities. And they were given, aligned with a certain grade, whether A, B, C, or D, D being a failing grade or hazardous community. So after they were finished with all of uh, these gradings, right, this redlining, they then took the reports back to the federal government and the federal government then used that to implement policies that would disinvest again, right? Uh, in these black and brown communities. If these communities hadn't already been suffering, now they decided they were not going to allow VA or FHA loans into these communities. Again, starving these communities of the resources that they needed to thrive. We then saw the commercial interests following suit where banks said, well, if the federal government isn't going to invest in these communities, why should we as business men or women continue to invest in these communities? And so they started redlining. Then we saw the same thing with other commercial interests, right? From grocery stores, from pharmacy chains, uh, hospitals and the like following suit. And what do we have today? What do we show? We know that research has shown that there's a direct link to aggressive breast cancer prevalence among African-American women from that time period. We know that today there is a poverty tax on many black and brown communities in the form of higher payments for auto insurance, mortgage loans, et cetera. We know that there are all of these deserts in our community from food, pharmacy, hospital, right? Making it more difficult to access resources to improve health and maintain health. And then we've moved away from redlining to blue lining. 
with climate change in this country, climate gentrification happening across the country, which again is displacing many, many individuals. Think about it this way. If you think about the history of this country, if you were to go into many black neighborhoods across this great country of ours, you would notice that there is a major highway that cuts through many of these neighborhoods, right? It's not that these communities were built around this highway. No, they were there before, but because of federal policies implemented in conjunction with state and municipal policymakers, they were then located in these invisible communities, these communities that they, they thought uh, had less voice, right? Less power. And so they created these um, through the Highway Act, uh, you know, these uh, major highways. We know that there was a displacement because of the Housing Act that created the urban renewal programs across the country that displaced over half a million African Americans. They then raised housing for these individuals and instead placed parking lots and bus depots into these communities. And if you look at New York City, that has the highest rate of asthma in black children, right? Is it any wonder six of the seven bus depots were placed in Harlem there in Manhattan? Are you kidding me? So, so is it any wonder when we think about these social determinants that have caused us to breathe in the most polluted air and caused us to have some of the worst chronic conditions? Uh, is it any wonder? So we have to remember that yes, these social determinants of health have caused these, but let's go further upstream and connect these social determinants to their political roots or their policy roots. We now know that today, as a result, these life expectancies have shown us. It's really no surprise when you think about um, across the board in cities, not only in Michigan, but across the country, when you look at the life expectancies. Michael Marmot, who's been a trailblazer in the social determinants of health movement, has stated that you know life expectancy as a measure of health tells us a lot about how society is doing. But the inequalities in health tell us even more. And that is especially true when you look at these um, life expectancy maps. And today, it's no surprise that all of these blue um, areas that have the lowest life expectancy um, really are predominantly African-American and Latinx uh, population groups. And what's troubling is, as we move forward uh, in the next 20 years, so today we rank 43rd in the nation in terms of life expectancy. And if you were to disaggregate all racial groups, if all white people in this country were their own country, they would rank 50th in the world in terms of life expectancy, lower than 43rd, right? That's troubling. If you were to take all African-Americans and uh, they became their own country, they would rank 103rd in the world double that of whites. And if you were to take all Native American groups in this country, all tribal nations, and they became their own nation, they would rank 143rd in the world. What's especially troubling is that over the next 20 years, we're expected to decline in our life expectancy rankings worldwide, and um, from 43rd to 64th. And this happening all the while we are moving towards a more racially pluralistic society. So think about that as we move forward. We know that policy, as we've just discussed, has been a driving force for many of the health inequities we see and have experienced in this country. But um, I believe that it is very important to understand those policy levers that have been pushed and pulled to advance the cause of health equity in this country. This is important. If it weren't important, we wouldn't see that incredible advocacy on the opposition side, right? to break down and undermine every attempt to drive health equity in this country. So let me quickly, in the last few minutes that I have, uh, bring this up. You heard me talk very quickly about the Freedmen's Bureau Act. I obviously don't have time to go through all of these various campaigns, but I do wanna focus on this notion of minority health for a moment um, and, and talk about you know, the, the effort. We know that there was an effort uh, you know, way before the United States was uh, formed as a constitutional form of government to abolish slavery and to ensure that equity was prioritized. Those were always defeated. But then we got to 1790, 1789, 1790, once the government was formed, health equity leaders had recruited a major influencer, political influencer, Benjamin Franklin, to help them uh, really push this equity agenda in health policy. Well, as you can imagine, Benjamin Franklin agreed to lend his name to a letter. It was sent to that Congress, the newly formed Congress, and they were upset with Benjamin Franklin. How dare you, Benny, bring up this issue when you know that we are just forming? 
we're just getting settled. Why would you do this? And um, the Senate said, we're going to ignore his letter. But the House said, no, we're not going to ignore it. We're going to answer him. And by bullet by bullet in a letter to him, they made comments why they couldn't abolish slavery, why they could not stop the separation of children from their mothers who were enslaved, why they couldn't stop the breakup of these families, why they couldn't provide adequate clothing or food to these individuals or education or medical care to these individuals, right? Line by line. And before Benjamin Franklin could respond, once he got that letter, uh, three weeks after they had gotten his letter, um, he had passed away. And that was the first time in our nation's history in which the light of health equity had dimmed uh, in, the ter in terms of trying to advance more equity focused policies. It would take us, like I said, 75 years before we got another attempt during the Civil War. That one again was extremely contentious, but this time around, they succeeded in passing the Freedmen's Bureau Act. Unfortunately, during that debate, there was still a provision in there that was contentious. It was the provision to provide medical care to newly freed people, formerly black slaves, as well as poor whites who were displaced as a result of the Civil War in the South primarily. Well, uh, ben Benjamin, uh, actually President Abraham Lincoln decided to go ahead and sign that law. But then four weeks later, we know that he was assassinated. And interestingly enough, his supporters decided that they couldn't squander that crisis. And they believed that you could read that the law, the Freedmen's Bureau Act authorized them to actually provide medical care to black, to black um, uh, newly free people. And as a result, they went about uh, creating Freedmen's hospitals around the country, right? We know Howard University Hospital was one of those. We know in Missouri and other areas that they created uh, these Freedmen's Bureau, these Freedmen's hospitals. Well, over time, as you can imagine, there was an effort uh, year after year for seven years um, to undermine that law. On the seventh anniversary of that law, they finally succeeded in um, repealing that, that policy and undermining the program, terminating it. And it would take us again about 120 years before we got to see more piecemeal approaches uh, to health equity in the form of federal legislation. A very sad and upsetting story but one that we have to be mindful of as we move forward. So I wanna, in my last few minutes, raise a very interesting topic. I think many of us have been distracted by the um, executive and legislative branches of our government, but the Supreme Court, the judicial branch has been you know, working um, very quietly to undermine health equity um, and this equity lens that we have been working so hard to take to policy. To, to create more inclusive policies. So initially, you know, in, in the um, 1870s, 1880s, there was an attempt by the Supreme Court back then uh, who were Southern sympathizers um, and uh, slave, uh, slavery sympathizers uh, who had denied the existence of inequities in our society and their link to a political determinant. Uh, eventually, through the work, um, the diligent work, of many health equity leaders, they pushed back and said, no, there are inequities, there are vestiges of, of past segregation that have resulted in the poor outcomes that we see in minority communities today. And uh, you can't deny it. And they can be tied to a political determinant. So finally the court says, okay, fine, we agree. But after a while now, we've seen this court shifting. And in very recent um, cases, right, civil rights cases, the court has been recycling this argument that past that vestiges of past segregation by state decree do remain in our society. Past wrongs committed by the state and in its name are a stubborn fact of history and stubborn facts of history linger and persist. But, but though we cannot escape our history, neither must we overstate its consequences in fixing legal responsibilities. Think about that. Neither must we overstate its consequences in fixing legal responsibilities. So why is this declaration alarming? It's alarming for three, for three reasons, at least, right? First, the court fails to take into account the evidence from a broad spectrum of research in medicine and public health, science, nursing, you name it, demonstrating the lasting impact that these vestiges of slavery segregation and subsequent unjustified discrimination have on population groups. Second, 
the court statement, its opinion has a rippling effect into other case law at all levels, right? Setting a precedent for other policies that have been commissioned by other governmental uh, bodies. Third, the court's been arbitrarily determining the point at which these vestiges of legally sanctioned discrimination cease to significantly impact certain communities, essentially arguing that, you know, after a certain amount of time, it doesn't matter anymore. Get over it, is the argument. That's the same argument that the court in the 1870s and 1880s, when they were terminating all of the major civil rights um, laws at the time, argued, saying that 18 years after 225 years of slavery um, was, you know, that that was enough time. 18 years was enough time for black folks to get off and, and pull themselves up by their bootstrap. Well, let's talk about why this is really concerning. Um, you know, we must connect the social determinants of health to their legal and political roots. This is why the court would rather view inequities as products of private choices or products of the social determinants. So they do not have constitutional implications or legally enforceable remedies, okay? If, they, if that inequity in our society is tied to a social determinant, the court's arguing that, well, if it's a socially derived inequity, there's nothing that the law can do. We can't force black and white people to love one another, right? We can't force people to love and, 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 and be friends. So you know what? It's just the natural order of things, right? That's their argument, essentially. Well, health equity advocates who continue to make the case that inequities are solely socially derived and fail to show the political connection will only bolster the court's viewpoint, thus just weakening the legal protections to check these structural and institutional forms of discrimination, as well as denying legal remedies to those who are impacted by inequities. So let me close by bringing this back home about leveraging the political determinants of health. We are in a very serious um, pandemic, actually, you know, a triple or quadruple pandemic, if you will, uh, when you think about it. We know that in the past, um, you know, coronavirus, much like many of these past pandemics, have been negatively impacting and further disadvantaging uh, communities of color. And review of studies, study after study, study have shown that in this country, you know, when pandemics, natural disasters, wars, and other crises are reviewed post-event, these disparate groups are always the same ones on the downside of advantage and opportunity, the ones most negatively impacted. We, we were able in certain crises, right? When it comes to wars, as you've seen, when it comes to natural disasters and recessions, to take an equity lens to policy and create somewhat of an equity uh, centric response, but we've never been able to do that in a pandemic, which is quite alarming, quite concerning. So my hope is that as we are going through this, this pandemic, we will recognize this history. We will leverage the political determinants to correct this and to stem the tide that, these, uh, that this pandemic or these pandemics have been having in our communities for generations. You know, there's this wonky model that I came up with in my book, uh, which I don't have time to go through, but um, one of the main points here is that to advance health equity, we have to demonstrate the value of investing in change. There are multiple levers that uh, have been shown based on the evidence to have worked in the passage of those health equity centric policies. Um, but here's how we can, I think, elevate health equity in America. Move that needle a little bit closer uh, towards the advancement of health equity in America. We really need to engage in the tough conversations and advocate for a full commitment to tackling health inequities upstream in all areas. We have to talk about race, place, and class. You know, I think the good news is that these structural barriers that we've been talking about and the resulting inequities are not permanent, but it's gonna take greater action and collective agreement from all of us, right, who are committed to stomping out inequities to formulate and execute the strategies and the policies to overcome them. We have to work upstream to address the social and the political determinants of health inequities, understanding when they are at play, so critical. We have to research the history of our communities. I think as a transient society, we move around so much, it's so easy once you've gone into a new community to make judgments about the people who live there, right? And what they've had to struggle with. You need to address the past policies and programs at all levels that created perpetuated and exacerbated these inequities, 
remembering exclusion has always been easier to realize than, than, than inclusion when it comes to policy. We have to strengthen our networks and engagement. We become complacent over time. We need to infuse new energy into this. And lastly, we have to understand that health equity begins and ends with the political determinants of health. I want to close with this thought, right? Health inequities and health injustices uh, will persist like they have for generations in America unless we seriously tackle the root causes or those upstream, those pesky upstream factors, notably the political determinants of health. And so I want to leave you with this thought by my dear friend and mentor, Dr. David Satcher, who has stated that we need leaders who care enough. More than ever, we need leaders who care enough to do something about it, who know enough, who have educated themselves about these determinants, these political determinants. They have the courage to do enough, to speak up, do something about it, and who will persevere until the job is done. You see, in this country, when you look at the few instances in which we've realized equity-focused policies, once the political pendulum swung to such a degree that it unraveled some of those gains, the advocates lost the political will to push back on those, on those attempts. And I hope that this time around, we have leaders today who will not allow that to happen, who will continue to use their power and their privilege to do the right thing to move that needle forward like it's never been done before in this country. And I wanna thank you again so much to Gift of Life, Motep, and to all of you for your diligent and continuous leadership in this movement. Wow, thank you so much. There's uh, so much there. You hit your stride right in the middle there. You can tell that this is your, your, your passion and it's very much conversations that I have uh, routinely, and I, a lot of that resonated uh, with me. I, I didn't you. know that I was going to actually praise a lawyer today, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is actually an attorney, but uh, <laughs> I thought many of the things you said, and, and Dr. Satcher was a gem. Um, yes. You know, so, but um, uh, many of the things you mentioned were very deep and complex, and I fear that you may have lost some of us on this excellent work, but then your examples um, and your gifted present pre presenter, I think brought those those back. I'm gonna give you um, a few pointed questions um, sure. as well. Um, I thought your work was powerful and significant, and I think the larger audience um, needs to know why you might be doing well or not so well, and how you got there and that as a, as a community, and that the status quo cannot hold uh, just because you feel that you're okay, because you're not in a high risk group now. Uh, and we see that politically uh, to, to today, because that may change. An example in Michigan may be, or the Midwest is the manufacturing industry. Right. You know, 30, 40 years ago, a college degree was maybe not significant for a lot of people. They worked in the plant, they did well, have a lot of patients, have summer homes and the like. Political will changes, jobs goes overseas. Now all of a sudden in that group of people, that had fared so well in a manufacturing economy are now struggling, whole communities yep. that are dying. So let me give you this question. How receptive do you think the larger community is to your message when most people feel their success is personal? They even had a, uh, a branding of that. Uh, I built this, if you remember that a few years ago. And they don't believe that any of it is propped up by political or government decisions, although you've outlined them very uh, uh, clearly there, and they don't think that they've benefited disproportionately. You, you know, Dr. Danny, thank you for that, um, that question, because it, it is one that uh, I, I have struggled with, but I'll tell you, you know, what seems to have resonated is, and the times that we've been successful in passing uh, those health equity focus policies over time, was when they you know, did not make that moral argument. I can talk about, you know, the fact that 83,000, more than 83,000 African-Americans are dying each year um, because of health disparities, right? I can talk about that until my, my tongue is bleeding and it will not resonate with many policymakers. But what we have noticed is when you make, when you tie it to an economic argument and a national security argument, those are the times in which that policy uh, initiative was able to see the finish line, right? Get over that finish line and they get implemented. 
you know, in addition to that, what we've also seen is that the comprehensive policies that were developed to move that needle of health equity forward were done on a partisan basis in this country. The, the more piecemeal attempts at uh, prioritizing this uh, agenda uh, were done on a bipartisan basis, right? So there are all of these different things when you think about it, what has worked, what hasn't? Well, I, I think it is so important that if you're, if you're working with a group of folks who, because of their personal interests, can't make those connections, you really have to think of a way to help them understand how, how they are connected you know, to, to this idea, this policy agenda. We know that if you can show that there is a commercial, if you tie that policy agenda to a commercial interest and a government investment value, those are the ones that seem to make it over the finish line, right? So you have to show what's in it for the government. So there are multiple hurdles you have to go, you have to overcome, right? Of course, there are those issues of uh, racism, structural, institutional, intrapersonal, even interpersonal uh, racism that you have to overcome to get that policy idea uh, through through the um, finish line. But but once you tie that now to a government investment value, what we have seen, even with the Affordable Care Act, when we were pushing uh, that policy back in 2009 and getting it passed in 2010, we had to show that um, young people, right, between the ages of 17 and 24, were sicker than they've ever been. There was a study that was done in the 1940s around the end of World War II that showed that 20% of young people were unfit for military service. After two world wars, people were malnourished. Uh, people were struggling. And, and after you know 100 plus years of being in existence as a nation uh, and the federal government uh, basically dismissing attempts to, to enact policies to take care of the general welfare of the population, the uh, federal government, you know, kind of flipped the script and said, oh, well, we have to do it now. It's a national security crisis. And that's when we saw this great awakening in policy, because now they were tying it to those to those and showing, wait a second, whether you like it or not, you know, what impacts black and brown folks also is impacting your community and stifling our national security interests. So I, I don't know if I have a better argument for you than to tie it to showing how this has worked over time. But in, in the ACA debates, the reason why we got that over the finish line, even though it was uh, primarily uh, or, all, you know, with all Democratic support, but we even within with among Democrats, we had to show that now, be, you know, from 1946 in 2009, we had moved from 20 percent of young people being unfit for the military to 70 percent of young people being unfit for the military. And if you truly are concerned about our national security interests, you better understand how this ties to health policy. And we've got to do something to correct this or else we're in big trouble moving forward. And that, you know, that got people to wake up and say, whoa, we've got to do something. And it helps when you have, you know, almost uh, 800 retired generals and admirals saying, yeah, this is a national security issue, right? So you're right. You will always have those people who can never connect the dots, but we are trying very hard, and I think we need to do a good, a better job showing the interconnection then about how this does eventually come to harm you. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't envy you. Uh, that's incredibly heavy lifting, <laughs> convincing uh, people and dealing with, uh, you know, politicians. You know, my patients go to sleep, and uh, I'm able to do everything I can do without uh, much <laughs> resistance. <laughs> well, uh, like you, Doctor Denny, you, you talked about your hair earlier, right? Yes, this is why yes. my hair is turning grayer by the day, right? <laughs> hey, that's just wisdom. God sprinkled wisdom in there with you. That's not so, <laughs> is that what that kid. is? Oh yeah, yeah. I remember when I got I, I had a gray eyebrow, short story, <laughs> and uh, my patients originally would come in and say, "Oh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, are you the doctor? Are you you? Are you the doctor?" And I'm like, "Yes, I got a knife, and I'm the doctor." And then after a while, they stopped asking. I guess I just looked too old. I had a little gray in my eyebrow, and I, I tried right, right. It, out, it didn't come out. So you know, you just take it. You take it how you give it. I, I, yeah. I'm okay with that. Um, another question before we wrap up. Um, sure. You've outlined the current political determinants of health, and I like the way you weaved in many, many. Because um, even our community doesn't always know that. You know, we hear redlining. We don't really know what that means. 
you know, ta Coates might write an article that gets some yeah. press, but, you know, not everybody's reading ta Um How do you see these changing in the future? And if so, how? These political determinants of health. Well, I'm, I'm very pleased. And, and I don't think that, um, you know, when I was, when the book had gotten published in March, I never envisioned that we would be going through um, this pandemic, right? But there is a, I, I start the book out by talking, you know, a, well, I created a story called The Allegory of the Orchard. And I talk about in the allegory, the, the storms that just suddenly come in, right? And, and hit our communities. The, the storms representing, you know, police perpetrated violence. Um, issues of storms like pandemic striking us with infectious diseases, right? That just come out of nowhere. Um, and, and natural disasters, right? That you know, hurricanes and tornadoes and so forth. And, um, and, it's, and it's interesting because I've been trying to get people to, to think about this conversation. I think social determinants is a, a, a safer debate to have. People feel more comfortable talking about social determinants. And I've been trying to get folks to say, well, all right, why don't we take our heads out of the sand a bit and connect that social determinant? Think about the instigator of not only these social, but these environmental determinants, et cetera. And you'll notice that there's a common instigator among them. It's a political action or inaction, right? That has created the status quo, that has created these structural conditions over time. Well, now that we're in this serious um, pandemic, uh, the likes of which we have not seen in over a hundred years, it has been, I think, very eye-opening for many people. Those who may have, you know, been concerned and 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 uh, weary about venturing further upstream, right, and and talking about the P word that scares a lot of people. Um, I think now they thought, oh my gosh, I can now see this in real time. The the triple pandemic that we're in has magnified these inequities to a point where you know you can't say you <laughs> you you are oblivious that you can't see. What is going on and you can't see how entrenched these inequities are in our society right if you are then i don't know how to help you but but they've been magnified and spotlighted to a degree that i think more people appreciate um what these drivers have done over time and what they will do so i will say that based on what we see i spoke with ambassador andrew young and even congressman john lewis before he passed and we had talked about the difference uh with the civil rights movement and what, what is going on today, right? With Black Lives Matter, uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement, with Color of Change and all these activist groups and what they're doing, right? To, to um, and, you know, open our eyes even further. And, and the, the hope that, you know, John Lewis and Ambassador Andrew Young gave me was, wow, it's so great to see black and white, um, Asian Americans and Latinx Americans, everybody coming together, these young people coming together, such diversity, right? that say, you know, we're tired of the status quo. We're tired of an unfair society. This is unacceptable to us. And they are fighting against the grain. That gives me hope. And I think more people are waking up. And I hope that this is not just a moment, but that it's going to be a movement that continues to be, that is sustained moving forward. Because if we don't, again, once with this pendulum, there's a lot of damage that's been done. It might take us another 150 years to realize what we've attempted to do the last 150 years. Impressive, impressive. So before I close out, can you share the title of your book? Sure, thank you. So it's it's called The Political Determinants of Health. Okay, straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Dawes, thank you so very much. I'm My gonna pleasure. send it back to Kenyatta shortly. And I just wanna say, in doing this for the number of years that I've done this, um, we did it from a small conference room at Wayne State, which is probably my first time to doing it on many different campuses and doing this virtually shows the will of uh, uh, the people in the group to actually continue on with this very important thing. I'm very impressed with the speakers today. Um, I thought you guys did a top-notch job and the top-notch job in recruiting the speakers that we got today. Um, this is not always information that we get at this high level from such accomplished uh, uh, people. And I wanna thank the team very much. So I'll go back to Kenyatta and Kenyatta, if you can help us close out. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for making me uh, look nice and sound nice because my introduction was very sweet. Um, and I'll let you finish and thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Denny, for such great moderation and just, again, all that you have shared and contributed as part of yourself today. Wow, everyone, what a great symposium. Uh, thank you all for joining us. We thank and acknowledge each of our speakers. Thank you, Jerome, for grounding this uh, symposium and challenging us uh, to be grounded in purpose. Uh, thank you, Dr. Collender, for all that you've shared about the history of this field, as well as history about Drs. Drew and Kuntz. Uh, thank you for challenging us even to use uh, traditional and even non-traditional methods to really rally around the importance of living donors. And uh, thank you, Dr. Dawes, for helping us to recognize that determinants of health inequities must be actively combated to ensure health access for all people. This has truly been a wonderful event. And so for those of you who are with us, what are some actions or takeaways from day one of this symposium? Number one, we ask you to register to be an organ donor. No, to organ donor. Number two, tell the story about the history of this work. Number three, encourage others to be a donor. And we ask that you then now take a look at the slide. Uh, we want to, as we think about last minute housekeeping items to close out day one, just to remind you that this is a preview of the raffle for the symposium. It's exciting. Um, you'll see some great prizes that we will be uh, raffling off and the winners will be announced tomorrow. And so we look forward to having you join us uh, for tomorrow and day two. Uh, thank you because uh, we are excited already to know that you'll be joining us for this great lineup. You'll see it here on the slide. And so don't miss any of these incredible speakers uh, that will again gift us with great information and their valued presentations. And then we last ask you to just take a look at the evaluation link that's in your uh, uh, program book and on this slide, uh, as well as utilizing the QR code in order to access the evaluation and then information about the CEUs. Join us for tomorrow. Day two will be a great day. And we entrust that each of you will enjoy the rest of your day today. Be well. <laughs>